Coming up on DTNS, China's thriving indie publishers receive a blow. Google blocks a decentralized chat app, and Apple makes an official password management extension for Chrome. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, February 1st, 2021. Welcome to February. Happy Patron Day in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm producing the show today. I'm Amos. Yes, Roger has the day off, but Amos is in for us today. Rich Strappolino producing as well. Uh, we were just talking on Good Day Internet about jazz drives, TIFFs for our signatures and floppy disks, uh, as well as school dress codes. Uh, if you want that wider conversation, become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google announced it will shut down its in-house game studio that was meant to develop games for the Stadia game streaming service. General manager for Stadia Phil Harrison cited costs as one of the reasons and said Google will focus on deepening its business partnerships. Stadia game studio head Jade Raymond will leave the company. So didn't even give it a year. Ford and Google announced a six-year partnership that will see the automaker adopt the Android Automotive Automotivate platform for infotainment on Ford and Lincoln branded vehicles starting in 2023 and also use Google Cloud as its preferred cloud provider. On top of bringing embedded Google apps to drivers, the partnership will establish a collaborative group called Team Upshift, <laughs> get it, to develop right. new consumer experiences and services using Android Automotive for things like maintenance, trade-in offers, and new car buying. Well, we were having a good conversation in our Discord's Google channel about uh, what the security update commitment will be for that. Xiaomi filed a complaint against the U.S. Defense and Treasury Departments in a Washington district court over being added to a list that forbids investments with firms with alleged ties to the Chinese military. Xiaomi called the action, quote, unlawful and unconstitutional and said the company is not controlled by China's People's Liberation Army. A new feature in the iOS 14.5 developer beta that will allow for unlocking a device with Face ID while wearing a face mask requires also wearing an Apple Watch that is paired to unlock the phone with users getting a haptic buzz on the watch when unlocking the phone. So very handy if you've got an iPhone and an Apple Watch. Users can also lock their phone from the watch. No, it's just unlocking your phone with Apple Watch, really. Just what that sounds like to me. Uh, in Nintendo's fiscal Q3, the company announced it sold 11.57 million Switch consoles. The Switch now has outsold the 75.94 million lifetime units of the Nintendo 3DS. The company also sold 76 million software titles in the quarter. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe and Animal Crossing New Horizons have both passed 30 million units sold. All right, let's talk a little more about uh, the latest in the tit-for-tat between Apple and Facebook on privacy. Let's do it. Apple is implementing an app tracking transparency tool in iOS this spring that requires users to opt in to have data tracked outside a company's own app. Apple has been very vocal about how it's trying to put the control back in the hands of users. To get people to do this, Facebook is testing a new pop-up notification on the Facebook and Instagram iOS apps. Obviously, Facebook owns Instagram. Both ask users to opt in to sharing their identifier for advertisers. The pop-up explains how Facebook uses personalized ads, that if you opt in, your ads will be more personalized, you will support businesses, especially small businesses, won't increase the data collected, but if you opt out, ads will be less relevant to you. It then gives you the option to allow or don't allow. That triggers the Apple privacy pop-up. You see that all the time, especially when you download new apps, that gives you the option to ask app not to track or allow tracking. Apple's App Store guidelines allow for these types of prompts Quote, so long as you are transparent to users about your use of the data in your explanation. Yeah, I guess this is getting a lot of uh, attention today just because of Facebook and Apple, you know, Facebook threatening to uh, launch an antitrust suit against Apple and, and, and taking full page ads out against Apple. And, and so this is a tangible thing in this fight of this is what Facebook's actually going to do to try to get people to convince people to opt in. And to me, this this feels a lot more legitimate than taking out full page ads where you try to claim it, the small businesses are your concern. Facebook's bottom line is its concern. Uh, this is saying to, to people, hey, uh, if you opt in, nothing's gonna change. It's already data that, that we're collecting uh, on you. I mean, 
what would change is if you didn't opt in, they would collect less data. But all right, you know, potato, potato. Uh, and will your ads will be better. Uh, that That is a straightforward proposition. And Apple's pop-up right after that is going to say, like, do you want them to to track you outside of this app or not? You know, like everybody gets their say and then you as a consumer can make a semi-informed decision. Yeah, it's the it's the order of things that I think is a little wonky. When you see Facebook's, you know, I've only seen screenshots of both of these, but when you mm -hmm. see Facebook's, hey, here's what's going on. We want to support businesses. You know, a lot of the little guys work with us. We really count on you to allow uh, those folks to be able to track you so they can, you know, put food on the table. It's it's definitely arranged in a way where you go, okay, yeah, this doesn't seem so bad. But then when you see the Apple pop up right after that is like, allow Facebook to track you? Yes or no? And so I think a lot of people, by the time they see the second window, they're like, well, no, actually, no, maybe not. Maybe I don't want to do this. Because, of course, Apple isn't trying to make it sound nice and rosy. And, yes, Facebook and Apple have been going back and forth about, you know, what is the what is the best practice for users in general when it comes to stuff like this. So Facebook is definitely going to see some, some fallout. They are being extremely dramatic about how bad they think the fallout might be. And I don't know. I guess it remains to be seen. But there are definitely going to be a, a good amount of folks, especially you know people who say like, "Well, I don't trust Facebook, even though I use it every day. I don't trust them." So that you know, if I have any say in this, then no, don't track me. I yeah, honestly, there's some psychology going on here, right? Uh, and the psychology is we don't assume people are paying attention. How can we set it up so they're more likely to choose what we want them to choose? And what Facebook's doing is saying a lot of people will click allow because we made allow blue and we made don't allow gray. Uh, and then when they see the next pop up from Apple, no matter what it says, there'll be one that says allow and they'll be like, yeah, no, I said allow and they'll double click and hopefully that will improve compliance. Uh, it's, it's sad, but I mean, this is the state we're in right now until we get some kind of other system that gives us control over our data rather than having other companies try to fight each over uh, each other and try to trick us into letting them have access. Independent publishers thrive in China on platforms like WeChat and Toqiao. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of independent publishing. You may not realize how much TV shows and movies often made based on successful web no novels. If, if you know the Ten Mile uh, series, sometimes called Eternal Love, very successful web novel that was turned into a very successful TV show worldwide. Uh, in China, self-publishers are often referred to as We Media, which is both a reference to publishing on WeChat, uh, but also fan-driven. It's it's us, we, the people. Uh, in 2020, 360 million users read articles published on WeChat public accounts. Self-publishers have always had to make sure that they don't attract the attention of Chinese censors, but that usually meant just avoiding red light line topics like China-U.S. relations. Now that system is getting formalized and it's gonna be bad for news. A regulation published January 22nd by the Cyberspace Administration of China requires accounts that quote, provide online news service to the public shall obtain the internet news information permit and other relevant media accreditation. In other words, they're cracking down on people publishing independent accounts of news on WeChat, Tochao, Ten, you know, all those kinds of platforms, Baidu, Sina Weibo. Uh, TechCrunch notes that WeChat sent a notice to its users saying if your account lacks relevant accreditation, you are advised not to edit, report, publish, or comment on news about politics, the economy, military, foreign affairs, or other major current events. It doesn't seem like this means you can't say something as a you know, Sina Weibo user, it's that you can't set yourself up as I am reporting things. Uh, this may not affect the writers of Wuxia novels, uh, but it will dampen independent writing about news, which you may, some of you may be surprised to know was happening. There was some independent news bubbling up here, uh, and news permits are, are hard to get. The authority only granted 761 of them from 2017 to 2018. Remains to be seen where services like WeChat and Sina Weibo will draw the line on this stuff. But it's definitely going to kick the can somewhere else. Uh, those folks who like to publish independently in China will will have to look for the the next new technology that doesn't have as much scrutiny. Well, and what would a company like, okay, so WeChat says, okay, <laughs> if you don't have the blue check mark, so to speak, 
Uh, you can't just start talking about news and disseminating it on the platform. In, you know, you, you have to be vetted first and, and you have to get the go ahead. How much is WeChat going to be regulating this? Because if 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 so many people are using it this way and so many people are reading news this way and sure, no matter where you are in the world, whether it's China or the U.S. or anywhere in between, it is always problematic when citizens are just, you know, helping spread news. Sometimes that news is either just downright wrong sure. or, you know, there's an agenda or all that stuff. So that all comes into play. But WeChat doesn't want everybody to leave and, and go to the next big thing that has not yet sort of been found out by the Chinese government. So does WeChat kind of tread a line here and maybe no. turn a blind eye? And how much is... <laughs> Is WeChat yeah. going to be, you know, how much is, is are, are they going to be taken to task for not doing enough? The dynamics as I understand them, and again, I'm not in China, uh, but the dynamics as I understand them are uh, WeChat will crack down on this uh, pretty quickly and people will will fall in line because the the punishment for getting caught doing this isn't pretty uh, and nobody nobody wants that to happen to them. Uh, so I, I imagine that that WeChat probably won't have too much of a problem enforcing this. My my question is, the reason we had this happen is because this was a new technology that bubbled up and the slow moving wheels of government bureaucracy hadn't caught up with it. There, There's always new technology, right? So, and, and we've talked before about China trying to crack down on live streams and the and the branding stuff there, not the, not the news situation there, but is it like a cloud, you know, like a crowd space kind of situation? Is it is there some other social network that we're not hearing as much about right now? And that's that's where all these folks will go. I imagine there is. I just don't know what it is. Well, some good news for folks who use iCloud. iCloud. <laughs> well, it should be ironclad, hopefully. That's iCloud Passwords. Uh, Apple released something called iCloud Passwords, a Chrome extension to make passwords stored in the iCloud keychain available in the Chrome browser. The extension is available for Chrome on Windows and Mac OS, with passwords created using the extension on Windows syncing to iCloud. Yeah, this is this is big. On, on the surface, this doesn't feel like that big of a deal. Like, oh, a Apple making an extension to make it easier to use your passwords. But that Windows part, to me, made me sit up and take notice. I, I think, I I think it was on uh, SMR podcast this weekend. I was hearing the, the the guys talking about messaging, and why iMessage hasn't been made cross platform. Why why for goodness sake haven't uh, has an Apple made iMessage for Android? Uh, they could take over, and and the conventional wisdom has been, well, Apple doesn't make any money doing that, so why would they? Uh, but this is an indication that they don't have to make money to make something worthwhile. Uh, so as Apple moves slowly into services, and they want to get more money on services, they have a vested interest in making their services, including their operating systems, be more attractive, which is, of course, you want to use your passwords on Safari, uh, but you might not want to use Safari password management if you also use a Windows machine. Well, guess what? We're going to make it easier for you to do that. I I don't want to overinterpret this. This could just be Apple saying like, hey, we're all about security and privacy no matter where you are. So we want to encourage that. But it does get me one step closer to saying, well, now I wouldn't be too shocked if we started to hear about an iMessage for Windows or an iMessage uh, for Android out there, because Apple may be loosening that up and saying, you know what, we, we're we not banking on devices and we're slowly going to transition into being, you know, the operating system that the world runs on, uh, no matter where they are. Yeah, yeah. Infiltrating the way that people use devices, whether they are Apple made devices or not, computers uh, you know, mobile devices, all the stuff I think is really smart for Apple. And even though I don't use a Windows machine on a daily basis, because, well, I've uh, actually kind of switched to Firefox. I don't know. I'm all over the place, but Safari is the browser I use the least, not because there's anything wrong with it. It's just kind of my workflow. And I run into problems sometimes where I'm like, oh crap, yeah, that's not going to work here on Chrome. This just makes it that much more seamless for switching between a lot of devices because more and more we're all doing that. And I think Apple recognizes that, sure, it would like to tell us what is the absolute best way to do everything, and that's all Apple stuff. But that's not the reality of a lot of their customers, and it's more attractive when people have more flexibility. 
Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, for me, it's not really going to work either. Uh, cause I, I, I want last pass or something. And that's actually mm-hmm. what I use cause it's on all the operating systems that I might possibly use, but this is a step in the right direction. Hey folks, if you want to join in the conversation in our discord, like I said, we were in there talking about, uh, Android automotive earlier today, uh, joined by Lincoln to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Friday, Google blocked an app called Element from the Google Play Store, uh, supposedly because of abusive content. You may say, oh, okay, this is what we're doing now and going after all these apps who don't moderate properly. The interesting bit here is Element is an app that accesses the Matrix chat protocol. Element doesn't host or control Matrix chats. It's a decentralized or federated open source chat protocol. It's a lot more like IRC than it is like WhatsApp. Uh, Ars Technica points out, it's a bit like banning a web browser for the content of a website. Element does host some Matrix servers, including the home server of the Matrix.org Foundation itself, but Element says it strictly enforces its terms of service on those servers. Element has a full-time team dedicated to abuse reports, so they do moderate what they're in control of, but Element lets you access all Matrix chats, and they're not in control of all of those. That's kind of the point of a decentralized chat system. And Element's not new. It's been around for a while. Uh, You may have heard it called Riot.im back in the day. It used to be called that. It interoperates with Slack and Discord. It's used by millions of people, including governments, including the governments of like France, the US, the UK, uh, several universities. So this isn't a fly-by-night app trying to get around the rules. Google also didn't block other Matrix clients, just Element. Uh, and the suspicion was that Google uses bots to primarily review apps, and this was a bot making a mistake. It couldn't tell the difference between a chat that was on under Elements control and one that wasn't. Uh, often bans are, are based on content displayed from the web in Google because they don't have enough humans looking at this stuff. There was a video player recently banned for supporting the .ass video format, for example. Late Saturday, Element tweeted, quote, We just got a call from a Google VP who explained the suspension was triggered by a report of extremely abusive content accessible on the matrix.org server. Our trust and safety team had already acted on it and the app should be reinstated shortly. And it was relisted Saturday evening. So it sounds like, yeah, probably was something that was on a server under elements control at matrix.org possibly, but that they were on top of it. So maybe not a bot, maybe maybe an itchy trigger finger, uh, but it does bring up this question of, are we going to see trouble with decentralized apps? Uh, I, I think a lot of people thought like, well, if, if something like Parler can get taken down because Parler's in control, maybe the solution is something like Mastodon or something like Matrix, where there is no single element in control, but this shows that even those decentralized apps can still run afoul. Yeah, the whole, the whole, you know, was it a bot or wasn't it? Google isn't being super clear about, okay, here's what happened. Here's how we don't want something like this to disrupt the service that a lot of people and governments and universities may be using because of something that may have been caught from the web. Because again, it's like, I don't know if a browser <laughs> can can access something that is extremely abusive content, then you wouldn't have anything in any app store, right? You yeah, wouldn't have right. browsers, you wouldn't have you know, social networks, you wouldn't have anything. So that argument doesn't really work. And Google isn't saying, here's how we're gonna make sure that this never happens again. It's just sort of like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's what happened. We reinstated it all as well. And it all happened pretty fast, but you know, I mean, what if a couple of weeks went by? What if it was a little bit of a smaller company? And yeah, for Element to say, we're, you know, this is just a protocol that that's not even ours. I mean, it's we're just one of many um, uh, apps and services that might be able to access the matrix servers. Also, bots aren't perfect. Everyone knows that it's going to get better over time. But uh, I, I don't totally know what the solution is for this not to happen again unless Google says, here's what we've done specifically to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Yeah, I think that bothers me too. We didn't have Google come out and say, oh, this was a mistake or uh, it was a misunderstanding. Uh, we didn't have Google come out and say anything. And granted, I'm, I don't expect Google to come out and, and make a public statement on every single moderation decision in the entire Google Play Store. That's unscalable. But this is a significant one. I would like 
to hear it. It's a hot button issue. And when Element tweeted on Saturday, they said the suspension was triggered by a report of content on a server they controlled. Well, okay, that's not a bot necessarily. That's something that was under control. The argument with Parler was that they didn't have enough moderation in place. Is that what Google was saying here? They didn't have enough moderation in place? Was it some Google staffer who like just acted too quickly and Google looked at it later and like, no, 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 they have moderation in place uh, and it's enough because Element's saying our trust and safety team already acted on this. Like we didn't, we didn't wait, we acted on it, but we got yanked anyway. Uh, it's, I, I, I think you're right. There, we need to hear more from Google about it. Microsoft opened its Azure quantum service to the public. This will initially provide cloud access to dozens of qubits on ion trapped based quantum computers from Honeywell and ion Q with plans to offer designs from quantum circuits as well in the future. Microsoft plans to eventually use its own quantum computer designs for the service and is working on a qubit controller chip called gooseberry to govern thousands of qubits at once. I really like the name. Initial commercial tests of Azure quantum will will focus on the always popular molecular engineering, finding more efficient carbon fixing, and working with car, mer car maker BMW on optimal electric charging station deployments, and also, as we previously mentioned, auto parts supply chain logistics. Quantum computing might not be mainstream just yet, but Azure Quantum now joins Google Cloud's Q network and AWS's bracket as quantum computing offerings from the big three public clouds, as well as systems from IBM, D-Wave and others. Yeah, this is this is just interesting to to note. Uh, we have gone from you know ten years or so ago wondering if a D-Wave computer was really quantum or not. Is it really a quantum computer or is it just a classic computer that uses something that's kind of quantum? To full systems available in the cloud from all three of the big cloud vendors, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, and and Google, as well as IBM, as as well as as others out there like this. I, I was comparing this to where we were with mainframe computers in the late 60s, early 70s. That's where we are now with, with quantum computers. They're, they're available for you to rent, mostly for research purposes still, not terribly practical, but we've moved. We've moved from concept to actual services. And Tom, if I could jump in here real yeah, quick. Yeah. Uh, the One of the interesting things with Microsoft, you might say they're late to the game, they're the last public cloud. IBM and D-Wave have been doing this, for, like you said, for, for years now. Uh, they put out Q-Sharp, uh, which is part of their quantum SDK kit all the way back in uh, late 2017. Um, and so that was, you know, that was doing quantum simulation, but setting the software groundwork so that when something uh, like uh, Azure Quantum Services comes out, uh, developers can hit the ground running or at least have gotten their feet wet a little bit. Still extremely early days, uh, but they have been working on the software side of this as well. That's great to know. Thank you, Rich Straffolino, producer of today's show as well. Nike wants to save you all a backbend or two or three <laughs> or all of them. The company's Go Fly Ease sneaker is hands-free, totally hands-free, meaning that you can step in and out of your shoes, which look like running shoes. They're not slip-ons, they're not slides, using a bi-stable hinge. The Go Fly Ease can snap into place thanks to a tensioner. It's sort of a giant rubber band type thing that sits above the midsole, kind of goes all the way around the shoe and works the same way in reverse if you want to take your shoes off. Now, Nike initially made the shoes for people with disabilities, limited mobility, um, making it easy to t get shoes on and off, but it might be pretty attractive to you as it is to me because I often have a lot of things in my hands when I'm you know, at the front door. I want my shoes to be able to get in and off, but I want them to be nice and sturdy. A soft launch is set for February 15th for select Nike members. They'll receive invites to purchase and a wider launch is set for later this year. All right, so my immediate jaded reaction uh, to this story was, here we go again with Nike and uh, doing a publicity stunt with, with some shoes that aren't really, you know, any kind of blah, 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 blah. But then the more the more I looked at it, the more I realized that uh, this is, in fact, something that I, I absolutely <laughs> would want to have. Uh, I we, love them. We are a household that takes our shoes off immediately when we come in the door, uh, and like many households around the world, not all, but but many. Uh, so I I love the idea of having some shoes that I could just step in to walk out of the house, step out when I walk back in. Yeah, 
I, you know, I do a lot of jogging and, you know, anybody who's, I mean, even if you're doing like longer distance walking, your shoes have to fit just so. And laces are a big part of that, especially mm. if you kind of break your shoes in. It's like, you, you know, you kind of you need to make sure that it's nice and form fitting and, and, and it's good for your feet. With something that's a slip on, you know, my first thing is like, mm, how snug is it going to be without being too snug? But put all that aside, I think they look really cool and I would love these shoes. Uh, well, there you go. You got us again, Nike. All right, fine. Yeah, Just I know. Make Take them available. The problem with all these things is these stunts are never available. Like I never see them available for purchase anywhere. They're always select members. So yeah, we'll see what happens. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. On Friday, we had Lamar Wilson as our guest on the show. And Tim wrote in and said, on Friday's show, Lamar seemed surprised that Alabama had so much to do with space. Tom mentioned that Huntsville, Alabama has the Space and Rocket Center, but there's more to it than that. Huntsville, mm -hmm. Alabama also has a rich history with space. Werner Von Braun and his team developed and tested the Saturn V rocket, Saturn V rocket in Huntsville. Much of the U.S. military weapons and space technology comes from Huntsville. And just two weeks ago, Huntsville, Redstone Arsenal to be exact, was chosen as the headquarters for the new Space Force. There's so much more that connects Alabama to space. If you really want to come visit Alabama... Tim says, even if you don't, Lamar, we'd love to show you around. <laughs> yeah, uh, I I have very fond memories of uh, going to visit my uncle who lived in Sheffield, Alabama, when I was, I don't know, it was about 12 years old, uh, and going over to Huntsville and seeing the Space Museum. I mean, that was back in the early 80s. Uh, and I, I, yeah, it's it's only taken off, as they say, uh -huh. uh, since then. So yeah, shout out to, to Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, I know we have listeners more more than just Tim uh, there, so so thank you, folks out there in Huntsville, Alabama, for for all you do for the space program. Uh, good stuff. Thank you, Tim, for keeping yeah, us thanks, up to speed. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I've never actually been to anywhere in Alabama, so Tim, we'll hold you to it. <laughs> DTNS coming through one of these days. <laughs> if you have uh, some feedback for us, questions, comments, or anything, feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com is where to send those emails. We also like to shout out patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today, they include David Mosher, Reed Fischler, and Mark Gibson. Well, uh, folks, uh, it's patron day, uh, first day of the month. So this is when Patreon uh, pays us out, uh, the, the, the funds that you have given uh, so generously to help make the show possible. Uh, and to reward people who stick with us, we're happy to offer Patreon loyalty rewards. You can get uh, at the highest levels, the four highest levels of support. You can get a unique sticker, uh, a mug, a T-shirt, or even a hoodie at the top level every three months. As long as you stay a patron, they just keep coming. Uh, each one has unique art from Len Peralta featuring the DTNS seven-year anniversary logo this year. That includes one with Roger, one with Sarah, one with me on it, and one with just the logo. Get the details at patreon.com slash DTNS. Folks, we are live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2130 UTC. And you can find out more and spread the word. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash live. We will be back tomorrow with 5 by 5s Dan Benjamin, and we'll talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>